Good evening, everyone, to the Kenosha Public Library. I'm Patricia Bazier, one of the reference librarians here at the Southwest Library, and we're delighted to have with us two of our respected local ex experts on Kenosha theater history, uh, William Betcher and Donald Cutler. William Betcher is a retired systems analyst. He is currently serving as a board member on the Committee to Restore the Kenosha Theater. Donald Cutler has contributed to many historical articles in the Kenosha News and has collected many files on Kenosha's past. He is also considered uh, an expert, one of the experts on the death of Bridget McCaffrey. Her death increased awareness of victims of domestic violence. Both are experienced researchers. I can attest that they have spent countless hours, days, years uh, researching uh, information on Kenosha uh, theaters here at the Kenosha Public Library in our clippings file, uh, in our microfilm collection, and other sources, as well as other resources in the community. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Mr. Betcher and Mr. Cutler. And before, without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Mr. Betcher. Okay. Can everybody see the screen real good? Nobody that can't raise your hand, please. Okay, that's better. Uh, before I start, I've, I've got two trivia questions I'm going to ask tonight, and I'm going to ask the first one. It's, a, it's an easy one. Uh, why does your popcorn in the theater come in a cardboard box? Does, how many people know that answer? Lou, you know that way. No? Okay, because paper makes too much noise and it disrupts the performance. Okay. And later on, I'll ask you a tougher one. Okay, uh, the, uh, like she said, uh, Don and I, we've been actually, sp it's been seven years since we first started doing this, but actually we probably spent less than three, because every once in a while being retired and lazy or got other problems like surgery, uh, we take a year or two off once in a while and just put it aside and then we get back to it again. Uh, so that's, it's, it's just dragging out, but we've, We've learned a lot, and we're actually, well, I got 400 pages written so far, and I think I'm halfway done. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm just going to go through one, one of the six sections of the book, which is I'm going to show you a picture of what's, there's like, okay, there's 43 theaters and 24 locations, so that means there was as many as four theaters in the same location and or building. So there's really 20, so I want to show you the 24 locations, what's there today, and I'll talk a little bit about what was there. And I'll, any interesting little facts that come along, I'll try to throw a few of those out. If I try to th tell you everything, we'd be here for the next 24 hours. So I'm going to try to squeeze this into an hour, so I'm going to limit uh, my comments. Uh, like she mentioned, we, there's 500 spools of microfilm that we've gone through, as many as four to five times. Each time we go through it, we find something new. And uh, I've actually revised the format of the book four times already. I've, in other words, scrapped it to start over because things better. By the way, the reason I picked the uh, theater's 100 years, 1891 to 1990, sounds cool. 100 years? <laughs> and it's easy to remember, 100 years. And I put theaters first because when you do a Google search, people are going to be searching for Google for theaters more than they are than the other words. Uh, we use extensively the uh, library facilities here and at Parkside. The microfilm, uh, the city directories. The, uh, they've got a, the, the library here has a fantastic paper file where if because one of the things you want to go look up tax records, the tax records are at Parkside in the archives. But if you want to find out the address and location, you have to know the ward that, that's in. But the wards change every few years. 
So there's plat maps. Well, the library here has a fantastic paper archive of most all the plat maps. So you gotta go find the plat map for the year you're looking for the tax records so you can go to Parkside and look up the tax records. So that's some of the things we run into as that takes time consuming to doing this research. <coughs> oh, disclaimer, the accuracy of what we find is only as good as our sources. I read a book recently that said that had a disclaimer in there. Similar to that says, all errors and, and misquotes are the responsibility of my computer. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. This is the, these are pictures of the original. They're not the current. That was the Vogue. The second version of the Orpheum. Down on the lower right is the Majestic. And then the Kenosha Theater. I want to point out... Uh, over here, notice the, the brick architecture of this corner. Uh, when I show you today's version of that, you will be able to see that pattern. Okay, now what I've, what I've organized this sequence is I'm going to go from north to south in the downtown area, then I'm going to go from north to south all the other theaters that are outside of downtown. So the first theater that's north downtown was what was the PLAV, uh, there it is today as of last month. This is the uh, circa 1880, the Grand Hall. They changed the name already. They did change it already? Yeah. It was that way last week? Circa on 7th. On 7th? They better change their sign then. <laughs> but anyways, it was the Butterfly from 1917 to 1935, and then it was the Hollywood from 41 to 54. Okay. Uh, as you can see, this, this, is a, this is the way it looked after when it was the PLAV, and there it is today. Uh, everybody know where the PLAV was, right? Okay, so I don't have to explain that. This is a sample of what they've salvaged in the current place. There, there's the trim here, the eggshell and the arrows, and then there's the, the rosette there on, above the, uh, the chandelier. Unfortunately, that's the only picture I got of the current in there. Uh, down the road, then, there was, it, well, I have to update this now because it's not back as billiards anymore. It's something else. Uh, we, me and Donna spent a lot of time on this particular one because the addresses from year to year kept fluctuating. It was hard to pin down which building really was the theater because sometimes the address that we had was on this building and then it was on this building and then there's the halves, the 13 and a half, well 13 halves were upstairs. Uh, but we, our opinion is the yellow and green was the theater and it's the northern half of the billiard place. The it was the two theaters, Star, 1910 and 1914 and then the Cozy from 15 to 16. The, uh, the other half of the the mark, the uh, date on the cornerstone on the top there doesn't match the city records as to when it was really built. That date there is prior to when the city said it was built. Uh, anybody not? Well, okay, this is uh, right across from that restaurant. Marina Gardens. Gardens, okay. The first Orpheum. And the, then there was the Blue Mill. It's now a parking lot. This is Cooler by the Lake, right here. So that's the parking lot next to Cooler by the Lake. And this theater was almost like a, a barn. It was huge. Uh, it actually covered the parking lot, but it, it actually went into where the current street is, because the street was a little bit further over at back of those days. By the way, my, when, I put this, when I put these addresses up here, I'm showing the address today, and I'm showing the address pre-1927. Do you have a picture of it? Of the, uh, you get a little piece of it when you get a large picture of the roadie. But that's, a, you know, and then I actually, I've, his, the records we've looked up and the articles I've read says you can't, you, you, there's very few pictures of that one. Uh, it was torn down and they, when they made the Union Die. Well, the Union Die works? Is it called? Then there's the roadie. 
This is not the original roadie. This is uh, the roadie one was burnt down in uh, 18, yeah, 1896. Uh, it was rebuilt and expanded. 1927, that building was torn down and they built the gateway. And then for a period of a couple of years, it was the lake. And then it was the roadie again until present. Uh, little trivia stories about the, the opening night on the original roadie in 1891. Seats were auctioned off, so all the rich people in town obviously got first row front seats. Uh, they, pay, they paid the, like an exorbitant fee of like 20 bucks to be at the opening of the roadie, which was, when it was over, people were, I think, were demanding their money back. Because <laughs> there's two things. The performers that they booked were old, and they actually, it was so bad, the performance, that they actually cut it short. <laughs> and the other reason was is the gas pressure from the tank on the corner of Sheridan Road there was kind of low that night, so the, the lights were not very bright because the gas lights didn't have enough pressure. <laughs> so the, the next night, uh, Mr. Rohde made sure that there was an electric light hung in the center of the theater and the gas pressure was back up so the lighting was better after that now the there was there was three roadies there was a uh, peter senior he's the original he, he ran it to begin with then uh, joseph his son took it over after a period of time and he had another son peter his son the other son peter actually was the back then the advertising was you didn't ever you didn't there's not much in the paper. Advertising was posting bills. Little flyers you post to the telephone poles all around town, put in the store windows. And Peter Jr., that was his job, was uh, he was a bill poster. He eventually uh, got into advertising. He became a uh, automobile dealership and became an advertiser. Uh, in, he got into the business of advertising. Now, the fire in... Uh, 1896, it was uh, shortly after the, uh, they had a masquerade ball. It was put on by the ushers. But shortly after that, uh, Mr. Rohde was closing up for the night, and he noticed a small fire on the stage over in the corner. And uh, he went to put it out. It, was, it wasn't that big a fire at that time, so he went to put it out, but he, he asked for other people to help. Well, all the other people around there grabbed their personal belongings and ran. The theater burnt down. Okay, so they had to rebuild it, and when they rebuilt it, they expanded a little bit to the back and uh, uh, made it a little bit bigger. That's when they actually put in the slope theater seating. Prior to that, was it just a flat floor because they had dancing and balls, uh, banquets and stuff like that in there. Prior to that, oh, I forgot the guy that got shot. Yeah, I forget what year it is. I don't have it down here, but. Uh, it was right after the 4th of July. It was the 4th of July or the day after. You know how people back then, they liked to shoot off their guns on the 4th of July. Well, it was a hot night, and uh, they had the back door open behind the screen. And apparently, this, somebody was shooting, and the bullet came. They found, they, afterwards, they found the hole in the screen door and the hole in the screen. And it clipped a little girl's pigtail, ponytail sticking out the side, it clipped that, flip, clicked that, and hit the guy in the chest. But it had lost so much momentum, it just sort of almost like bounced. <laughs> but they did stop the show, go down and check him out and everything. He, he went home, there was, he wasn't really hurt. Huh? Oh, this is where the, the we were talking over here beforehand that <coughs> when they built the gateway, um, the people I was over there looking at their archives, and they had the blueprints for the gateway, and the marquee that was out front said Kenosha. And it looked just like the Kenosha that's on the Kenosha. <laughs> Except the Kenosha opened in September and the gateway opened in December. Now, when they built the gateway, they did something that I've, it's very unique. 
By the way, notice the architecture across the top and the face here, the bricks, uh, the way the bricks are and the, the roof line. Well, around the corner, oops, I got that's right. This is the lobby today. The ladies' lounge. And the concession stand. I'm not missing a slide. I had a, what I did is the, okay. Inside the, uh, you can see the, on the broad stop too around the corner, same architecture. Because when they built the gateway, they built an exit that was, would come out onto 6th Avenue, which is the southern half of the broad stop too. Now, some of the people down there, when I interviewed them, they claim that the exit was really in the northern half, which is impossible because it opened into an alley. Um, the bar came from, they, they call it a gentleman's entra entrance. Well, it wasn't, it was an exit. Because I got it on the, the uh, city assessors, it's got a little note that says closed off exit. So it wasn't an entrance, it was an exit. And if you look, if I, we, me and Don, we went inside and we tapped the walls to find out where the hollow, where they plugged up the walls. And it's in the main, it's right at the back of the main floor where the seating is. You don't have an entrance into your main floor from outside. So that was an exit, not an entrance. And uh, in 1939, they closed it off and it became part of the bucket. That's the wall behind the curtain. That's where the, en the en exit doors were to go out to 6th Avenue. Okay, uh, this, is, this is the parking lot. You know where the parking ramp is downtown? Right across from the Iserman and the Burke Building. That parking lot was the, uh, the Grand Theater. It was only open for it was open two years. Uh, it's claimed the fame is, it's got one note already, the, the first week it was open they had a fire in the projection booth. Uh, the owner had to go to the hospital, he burned his hands, but the fire was put out and there wasn't very limited damage, they were open the next day. But because of that, uh, within two months the fire chief posted new safety ordinances, fire codes for theaters. Okay. Um, And this theater happened to have met that code. That's why it was actually contained within the projection booth. This might be familiar, okay. To the right is, this looks like one building here, but there's really two. This is the Iserman building, and this is the Burke building, this part here. This here is a, the marquee from when it was the Ken. But it was originally the Burke, the Cameo, the Chief, and the Ken. And it did have a slope four, slope floor at one time. And when it was the Ken, it actually showed overruns or seconds uh, to the Kenosha Theater because it was run and operated by the same people. By the way, if anybody's got any questions as I'm going along, you know, feel free to ask. Fire here too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know which theater it was at the time that it happened. I think it was the Cameo when it, when it had the fire. Yeah, there was quite a few fires throughout the years, many different theaters. Okay, then we took the Burke. Oh, Princess One. This, this, is, this one almost didn't make the list as a, as a real theater. It was actually, uh, oops, wrong button. Go back. Okay. Right about here, this is a whole strip of stores where the courthouse, the county courthouse is. Right about where that flagpole is, there, there was a small theater for a very short period of time. And the majority of the ads that we found weren't for movies or performances or anything. They were for cooking school. But the cooking school was at, in the daytime at the Princess Theater. And it was probably, it's, I got 1911 of the 12, but it was probably open less than a year. 
as you can see, some of these theaters were, boom, they're here, they're gone. And some of them were there for a long time. Okay. Now, this is the majestic. Remember on the first slide I showed you what the brick? Well, right here, you can see the same brick structure as the roof line from that original picture I had on the first slide. But this is the southern half of the Raymond James Law Offices, I think it is. And this is the Majestic Theater, uh, 1909 to 1928. And this is one, uh, let's see, I was in, the, well, Lou's been in there, a couple other people. But the floor is, is dirt now, but in the basement, then it, it slopes up to the front, all the way up to the floor. Now, I want to have Don explain a, a little bit. There, there's a unique story with this one. The... Uh the original manager of that theater name was Charles Patini. He was known as Kenosha's Theater Man. And what's unique about this is that Charles was shot in 1920 uh, in, in August. He was shot at a, a garage about a block away from there. Uh, <laughs> the story is Charles then made his way back. He had parked, went to get his car, but he got shot. He made his way back to the Majestic looking for help. He was shot in the abdomen. And uh, his manager, the, the guy working under him, uh, called for help. A police officer came, asked Charles what happened. Charles says, I know who it was. I'll take care of it myself. Charles was taken to the hospital where he then died the next day from his wound. Uh, subsequently, uh, sometime later, a man named Frank Lang was arrested for that shooting and murder. And Frank Lan Lang ultimately spent 18 months in Waupon State Prison. Oh, it was based on an anonymous letter, right? Based on an anonymous letter. That's pretty much all the proof they had. <laughs> well, they then received another 18 months later, another anonymous letter, saying that you better check the whereabouts of Ima Wanatka on that night, see what he was up to. So they let Frank Lang out of prison based on that. <laughs> and they tried, they, they did arrest and tried to uh, 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 blame Emo Wanatka for the murder. And the judge, when he went before the judge, the judge could, there was not enough evidence to charge Emo Wanatka with the murder. They threw it out. <laughs> they threw it out. The sheriff threw a big party for Emo. And, uh, <laughs> Because he was a personal friend. Yeah. <laughs> and Emo went back up north to Little Bohemia, and he be, there's, there's another story after that that uh, <coughs> Mr. Rugani is very familiar with. It has to do with a famous gangster and so on. But and we're talking. His letters actually came from Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. But Ch Charles Pacini uh, died with by today's standards, or by standards then, would, would have been a fortune. He had something like $150,000 to his name, uh, which was you know, equal to what today? Uh, several million, probably. And he made that on nickel admissions to a theater. But by the way, Charles Puccini didn't only run and operate the Majestic. He had the Strand, which he never lived to see uh, operate. And he had the Butterfly in the beginning also. So he was Kenosha's theater man. And the Lincoln. Did he own the Lincoln too? He was building it, yeah. Oh, he's building it, okay. Okay, thank by you. By the way, I don't have a record of that because it was never did, did, was done while he was owning it. Yeah, we got a different guy on that one. Yeah, that was a, was it a Lencioni? Yeah, there was a Lencioni was a partner. Look at that schmuck. With him when they, uh, with the, in the Majestic. <laughs> Dominic Lencioni? But F Frank Pacini, uh, was quite a name in his day. He was a wealthy man. Uh, he lived in a, on an interesting street, by the way, that no longer I'll exists. Tell story, okay. Later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go on and on. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I don't know if we're going to get done here, but we'll get, okay. This is where Garbs was, if everybody's familiar with Garbs. It's an empty, deserted building now. It's been deserted for ages. Um, that was the Palace Theater, 1910 and 1911. It was a very large building. It, it burnt down in 1911, I think, didn't it? 38, it was the Block Brothers. Building. It was the Block Brothers, Block Brothers building, which burnt down. That's pretty much all we can say about the, the Palace. Easy, interesting. 
I mean, you, uh, Adolf Alfieri. Oh, Adolf Alfieri. Oh, maybe I can go tell that other story now. <laughs> Adolf Alfieri, he was the, we're going to get to it later on, there's the electric theater, which is boom, here, gone, and Alfieri ran that one too, and he ran this one. But there's this um, Pacini and Alfieri, where today's post office is, okay? There was two apartment buildings right across the street there on Habstad Court, okay? Habstad being German for center. And it was one block long. And it had these two large apartment buildings. And Pacini lived in one along with Dominic Lencioni, which is his partner, and Alfieri was in the other build, in the other apartment building. Later on, I will go and get the, those buildings were then subsequently later years torn down, and they were going to build what they were the, the Wisconsin Theater was going to be built. They got as far as the, the basement and putting the I've got at the end of slide of this where the uh, support beams were put in place for the flooring. For the it was going to be the largest theater in this part of the uh, state. Never got done. It is, it, that all was right where the current post office is. So the, the Hobstab Court was one block. You got pictures of the Wisconsin? I've got the pictures of the foundation. There's a, there's a picture of it, a drawing. Yeah, the, I've got that too. The drawing of what it was going to look like when they yeah. finished it. Yeah. But I think it, went, it lasted for, they got five years before they finally went bankrupt. But I, I, I always suspect that if the Wisconsin ever did, would have gotten done and finished and built, that maybe that some of the others, like the Kenosha, would never have happened. Okay. This is, everybody knows what the leader store, right here. Uh, it's had many different faces over the years, but uh, back in the 1800s, it was the Central Music Hall. And in 1905, it was the Bijou Theater was built there. It was in that same building. It was remodeled when they made it the Princess for a very short period of time. Then it became the Virginian. And uh, this is the original building, by the way. The floor of the theater is still in the basement. And I think Lou mentioned earlier that there's, you can go in there, you can see the architecture where the projection booth was and stuff like that. It's been remodeled and expanded several times. Uh, when it was the Virginian, I believe the, uh, the Elks, it was the Elks Club. They had their meetings and everything upstairs. Um, I've got a couple of bricks that I salvaged from the stage area of that theater, and I'll show you the... This is the floor. What they did was, that in the basement, they cut up path through the floor so you can walk from front to back, but there's, so there's floor on each side of it. You can see the, the sloping floor. That's where the stage was. Up and right, oop, back up. Right in here was the stage. I, I picked up a couple bricks from there. There, I got them in the back there. There was a, they had a, they advertised as being the first talkie shown was it, was it the Bijou or the Virginian? Well, I think it was the Bijou. The Bijou showed the very first moving picture. Right? First, the very first. Actually, Central Music Hall, which became the Bijou. Yeah. But somewhere along the line, they, they, uh, they advertised that they were the first talkie. Talkie being, they had a bunch of actors behind the screen reading a script. And I think uh, one of the managers that owned it, him and his father owned it for quite a few years, they were actually actors that toured on the circuit performing. And they ran it and owned it for quite a few years. The Orpheum, the second Orpheum. Now this is the original building of the, what's there today. The, uh, the marquee, this current marquee is actually from the third version of the Orpheum, because you can see that it was the Orpheum from 21 to 30, then it was the lake from 30 to 33, and then it became the Orpheum again from 33 to 75. Now, again, it, it, there was, our scope only went to 1990, but after 1990, it again opened for a period of time as a different version also, but we stopped at 1990. 
Second trivia question. When, where, and why was the Woodward Theater? And I'm huh? Say what? When, where, and why was the, where's, where's the, the, or, the Woodward Theater? Woodward? Woodward. It's a trick question. I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, do I have the date here? The long Hot Summer. Joanne Woodward got an Academy Award for it. And when it showed at the Orpheum for that seven days, they changed the name of the theater to the Woodward. Oh, three, yeah, she got it for the Three Faces of Eve, but they were showing one, another one of her, the, what was it, Long Hot Summer, I believe yeah. it was. So that's a, a trick question. Kenosha Theater. This is actually because I've been actively involved with the committee to restore for the last 10 plus years. I've got a lot of, most everything is uh, along the side wall there. I've got all the framed stuff that's all from the Kenosha Theater. Uh, I've got the floor tiles from in front of the ladies in the men room. There's lipstick and lips, lips was in front of the ladies and top hat and cane in front of the men's. I've got glossy, some of them autographed of performers that performed at the Kenosha Theater. I got a list of, uh, a full page list of, at, during the war, Second World War, gas was rationed. People couldn't drive to Chicago or Milwaukee for, for because of the gas. So what, ha what they did was is they brought the bands and stuff like that. And the radio stations in Chicago had their own orchestras and singers that would travel around and perform at theaters. So uh, that 1941, there was a lot of, there was like, 30, 40 different live performances between movies. Uh, so was it Perry Como was part of the Ted Weems band, which was working for WLS. And they showed, uh, they showed the, they would show boxing fights, the championship boxing fights were shown at the theater, stuff like that. Uh, Blackstone the Magician disappeared an elephant off the stage. The, uh, was it the Three Stooges? The Three Stooges performed there frequently. Uh, they liked to go to the diner. That was their favorite, that was the reason they, they gave that, they gave that reason why they wanted to perform Kenosha, because they could go to the diner. <laughs> uh, hmm? Uh, this theater was actually uh, commissioned and built by Carl, uh, Carl Lenley, who was the founder of Universal Studios. He's from Wisconsin. When he built this one, he built two others, uh, the Sheboygan, and there was one in Racine, which has now been torn down. The Sheboygan has been restored. Over here up in front, there, I've got this uh, poster here with four different ads. Those are actually four movie premieres that premiered in Kenosha at the Kenosha Theater. The one, first one was on the opening day, September 1st, 1927, The, the Irresistible Lover. By the way, these are all universals because the, the, the studios owned the theaters back then. There's the Chinese Parrot, which it's unique. This is, that was the second Charlie Chan movie out of the 40 or 50 that have been made. But that was the second one and it premiered here. The 13th Juror, I had a hard time finding data on this because it was pretty obscure, but Edward Lemley was the director, which was Carl Lemley's brother. Uh, but they premiered that movie here. Uh, Francis S. Bush, X. Bushman was the, one of the stars. Some people may have, I've heard of that name, so if I've heard of it, some of you probably have. <laughs> then the, uh, the fourth one, The Melody of Love, was the first 100% all talking, singing, movie tone production. It was the first Universal Studios, Studios full talking, singing movie, and it premiered here. They made it with borrowed equipment at the nighttime when the other studio that owned the equipment wasn't using it. Now you, if you want to spend a lifetime researching the different methods and types of projectors and re, uh, cameras, you could spend a lifetime just checking, because there was literally tons of them.
to give you an example of uh, some of the things we run across in our research, we, you know, we research, document, look at books. We interviewed people, and one time I interviewed this guy who bragged in front of his family that he helped, what was her name? Esther Williams, the Olympic swimmer. She got into making movies. You could actually still go up, she, they, they, you still buy their, her swimming pools. Uh, they said that he helped her change her swimsuit between performances. I have spent many of our hours going back and forth over through all this, the microfilms, and I can't find anything that says she was ever there. <laughs> Although I did find that she was in Kenosha, but it doesn't, there's nothing that says she performed. She came here to uh, congratulate a local swimming Olympian. I don't remember what year that was, but the, that, she was in Kenosha at one time, but not for, the, not for swimming in a pool. <laughs> Uh, okay, New Year's Eve 1928, there was five vaudeville acts, five little bubbles with the names of the five vaudeville acts, and the one in the middle was Bob Hope. Okay. He was actually, at the time, I checked it out, he was performing in something in New York uh, called the Sidewalks of New York. So apparently he came to Kenosha to do a vaudeville act one time, New Year's Eve, 1928, and then went back to New York. Uh, uh, you can't see it from the front here, but with the, the basic architecture, this is what they call an atmospheric theater, the atmosphere being a Spanish castle courtyard. So when you go inside, there's uh, arches. There. The ceiling is a blue sky with stars in it, and they project a cloud, that, and then the, it goes across the sky, the ceiling. Uh, so this, this is a very, and it also was the largest. It's 2,300 seats. There was no other theater in Kenosha that came even close to that. The only other ornate ones we show you was the, the Majestic and the Roadie. Those are probably the top three as far as uh, artistic and atmosphere. This is inside the Kenosha Theater. This is uh, from the, s the stairway going up to the mezzanine. And uh, this is the stairway going up to the balcony. And down here is the foyer. Several years ago, we had, uh, there was five Frenchmen from France. Apparently, they had this unique hobby of every time, they, they, every year they had their uh, vacation. They would come to the United States and travel around the country and take pictures of old theaters. This is a 10-minute time exposure. And this is from the, this is a 30 minute time exposure in pitch black. Wow. What they did, the guy went around and took a light and painted the walls so that, that the film would then capture each line as he painted the walls. But it's a 30 minute, isn't it? The colors are awesome, isn't it? But that's the inside of the Kenosha Theater. This is the, from the foyer looking out to the street, there's three sets of doors. There's the inner lobby, the outer lobby, and then the street. The theater actually goes all the way from 5th Avenue to 6th Avenue, from sidewalk to sidewalk. I've had people when I've stayed and talked, where's the Kenosha Theater? I said, well, just turn around. You know, it's right there. The electric. Uh, this almost didn't make the cut also, but this was Adolf Alfieri that I mentioned before. Uh, see this white van here? Right there, upstairs, because it was 5913 and a half was the address. Yeah, I think, yeah, 5913 and a half. Uh, so it was supposed to, it, mostly bright, it was the first electric theater in Kenosha, but it didn't last very long. And the, the, the only ads we found very few ads, and the ads were movies, five cents. That's the ad. <laughs> but I've got, a, I've got actually an old picture of showing me the sign electric, and I've got records of it actually being recorded as a, a business in that facility, with that address. So it did exist, but it, it, the, I just like it because it's unique. 
Now that's all of downtown. Now we're going to go to the north side of the, in the, the Mid-City Drive-In. Yeah, it opened the one month before the Kino did. That's about all I got on the Kino. Outside it was, it was, as far, back then it was, that was way out of town. <laughs> and uh, there was a, the, what was that school? Berryville. Berryville. Yeah, I should forget, my mom went there. My mom went to Berryville. There's the Vogue. Everybody, that's Lou's favorite, right, Lou? I like them all. You like them all? The Vogue was very uh, well known for giving out, uh, there was Dish Night. Dish Night, so that you could get a complete set of China if you went often enough, long enough to get a, you know, one piece at a time. But apparently when they, the, the week that they gave out the gravy boat, uh, apparently I guess a lot of them never made it home because <laughs> they broke. And then they ran out of replacements and they never could get a replacement, so a lot of people ended up with a complete set of dishes without a gravy boat. <laughs> this is one of the few theaters, by the way, that had a nickname. It was called the Garlic Palace because of the ethnic neighborhood. <laughs> now this, uh, this is a parking lot. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's uh, on the other side of the street there. That's the, what, the, the flea market there. And there's a tavern on the corner. Then Johnny Midnight's is Kitty Corner. Well, in the middle of this parking lot someplace, at one time or another, there was, it was a, we, we haven't really been able to verify for sure because, again, the, the records show that the addresses keep shifting. But we think it was really one, of, it was one building that just changed names four times. So it was the West Side, the Imperial, the Waverly, and the Central. I know when I was a kid later, there was a Central uh, grocery store there. Because I used to go in there, go to the ball games at uh, Columbus Park and get a, get a quart of soda and a, and a pint of ice cream and go watch a ball game. Didn't some of those names just last for one year at a time? Well, you can see that it's from 1912 to 1914 and there's four theaters, so there's, there's some of, they had to be less than a year. <laughs> uh, there was a disastrous fire here. It was the west side. There was a, a, a spontaneous combustion and the rags under the stairwell. Okay. Uh, 500. $500, and they were open the next day, but it was, a, it was labeled, the headlines were disastrous fire. <laughs> uh, that's one of the things about these, these are all in the uptown area, sort of, and they're all parking lots today, and there's many theaters that change hands real quickly, and they didn't really last that long. All this, this is a uh, sort of the entrance or parking lot between Johnny Midnight's and the, uh, he has a restaurant there on the right. So this, this is sort of a, a parking lot, sort of, again. Uh, the pastime, Crystal, Strand, and Norge. That, that's one of the things we found out, especially with these smaller theaters that didn't last very long. They never announced they close. They just, you just don't see anything about them anymore. <laughs> this is the Columbia. It's right next to the Danish Hall on 63rd. It, uh, the Brown Bank used to be there. And I think it was a furniture store after that. I've, I ran across somebody that was when it, when it was the furniture store, and they said they could, they, they could tell where the projection stuff was, that it looked like it was a theater. Now this one is another one of those hard to prove. The Lyric, just south of the donut hole. There, which is not there, there's an empty lot on the corner there, but this is the building just south of the donut hole. And again, because of the addresses fluctuating from year to year, it's hard to pin down as to where in this building was the theater, was it the whole building or part of it? Because this particular block is full of a lot of apartment houses, so there's like 40 or 50 different addresses with names, and they keep shifting from year to year. A uh, couple of things about the... Uh, one thing we did, we did find out more about the people than we did the theater. Uh, the manager or owner of this theater was the head of the Carpenters Union. And uh, he lived just down the block, just south of there. Uh, I think his, his assistant manager lived across the street and ended up marrying his daughter. <laughs> Bell was the last name, I can't remember the first name. Do you ring a bell? <laughs> There's the Roosevelt. Obviously, that's not what's there today. No. 
We got some souvenir brick, bricks from that I got in the back there where I, I got one from the front and one from the side. I've actually taken movies and pictures of the actual tearing down process. Bill Exton was owned and ran it for many, many years. He was, uh, he was big in the, he, was, he loved kids. He had his desk and his office right down in the middle of the lobby. And he was always out there greeting and talking to the kids. And I used to live in that neighborhood. And when I, back in the 50s, when I used to my, go to the Saturday matinee, the way they, uh, the way he ran it was, is he would show a movie, show some cartoons, re show the movie again, show the cartoons. I think it's two or three times on a Saturday. And I love cartoons, especially when I was a kid. So I'd watch the movie, I'd watch the cartoons, and then I'd watch the movie again so I could see the cartoons again. <laughs> and my mom was wondering why I was getting home so late. So when I told her why, she called Bill, and from then on, he showed the cartoons first. <laughs> Little personal story there. There's the teardown. You can see the backs of the seats on the balcony. There's the last piece, just before they knocked it down. When did this happen? Oh nine. The Lincoln. It's now a church. Yeah, this is. It's now a church. It's in the Lincoln neighborhood. The uh, just north of uh, the St. Mark's, south of the Lincoln Superette. Uh, if you go inside, you can actually tell the features that were there because it was a theater. Okay, UA Cinemas. The it was really, it's probably I should break it apart into different segments, but where the pick and save was, it was the original UA cinemas, which were there was two theaters. And then they built, uh, in the, where the parking lot is now in front of it, that was, they would, had uh, five screens, UA cinemas. They had five screens for a period of time. Definitely. Then there's uh, Market Square. This is the original building. I think this started out as two screens and then converted to five somewhere along the way, and then it's now part of the uh, county job center. Okay. Can I explain something real fast, Bill? Yeah. Uh, Andy, when, when theaters close, it's real hard to determine in many cases because there is no definitive, okay, closed. They faded away in a lot of cases, like we were talking about the Vogue and others. They struggled to stay open due to the television came out or the war or whatever. So they faded away. You could run out of ads and not see another ad for a year. So yeah, they, they reopened. When did they close? It's hard to determine in a lot of cases. And the smaller ones never even advertise that they're opening. Although a lot of times when we had the, one of the things we noticed as we were finding openings where they actually advertise an opening, Every time a theater opened in Kenosha, it was claimed as to be the best, the greatest, and the most fantastic theater ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then there's the Kino Drive-In. Both drive-ins are on Sheridan Road. One is the northernmost, and the other one is the most southern. They both opened one month apart in 1949. Um, uh, as you know, there's talk about it's probably going to be this is the last year. The thing I remember about the, the Kino is the one we used, to, my family used to go to all the time. Because uh, we'd get in our pajamas, get in the back of the wagon, basically with our pillows and blankets, park backwards so we could look out the tailgate or the back of the wagon. And we'd go up and play on the playground, ride the train that they had in front of the screen. So it was a, it was a whole, it was like a whole day out to go to the drive-in. And then I can remember when I was older that on a buck night, was it? Uh, one driver in the car and four of us in the trunk. <laughs> that brings me to another story of the Kenosha Theater because the, those, uh, the fire exits up there just before the stage, they had the curtains over it and there's a stairway going up so you can go up on the stage from the main floor without disturbing the performance. 
well, we would get a bunch of us, the same five guys. <laughs> and we would get enough money for a ticket. The guy would go in, go behind a curtain, and open the door. Uh, it didn't take us very, well, it took us the first time, I think, we did that to make sure that the curtain was closed before we opened the door. Because <laughs> there was a lot of light came in there all of a sudden. My wife back there, she always accused me, I, I thought you were honest. <laughs> uh, this here is a, like this is a right here this, these walls and the grid work there that was the Wisconsin that never was the theater that never finished City Hall was over here and the present the current well at, it was present at that time the picture was taken uh, that was in 1924 it was actually taken from the top of the Elks Club. And look at all those, you know, Don, you can probably remember the names, all those factories in the background. Yeah. Well, a lot of that was Bain Wagon Works. Uh, Allen Tannery, we're looking at. Major, major employers. Okay, that's the end of the slideshow. Uh, I've just got to go, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, for, for you uh, technical computer geek type people, I got, I got a spread chart on a panel back there that shows the theaters alphabetically open, closed, number of day, years they were open across the top or by year, number of theaters open per year. And each bar represents the time that each theater was open. It covers in one sheet just about everything you need to know, basically. Uh, that's all. Thank you for coming. start a project like this and see the mess that's in there and how some people would look at that and say tear it down but when it's all said and done and we walk in that theater on opening night it will be very rewarding personally for me to see that. Working together a community can accomplish almost anything. The Kenosha Theater Restoration Project. Find out how you can help. 